So, um, certainly my honour and privilege to introduce the, this year's CEDAR Prize Lecturer. Uh, the chair of our selection committee this year was uh, Larissa Goncharenko. We had some outstanding nominations this year, and we're very happy to select uh, Joseph Huber from NRL as the recipient of this year's CEDAR Prize Lecture. To uh, quote some of the words in the nomination package, and there are actually more than one that nominated uh, Joe. Uh, Joe has led the development of unique computational models of Earth's ionosphere covering both global scale and small scale irregularities. Joe's numerical simulations of equatorial spread F have produced an explosion of important new results recently. In addition to new physical understanding, Joe's work has prompted new experimental design and has contributed significantly to the community-wide effort to understand ionospheric irregularities. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, recipient of the 200, 2009 E.O. Hulbert Annual Science Award from NRL, the highest award the commanding officer of the lab can bestow on a civilian. So without further ado, I welcome Joe Huber to lecture us on modeling global ionospheric phenomena, including, of course, equatorial irregularities. Yes, okay. uh, thank you, Tim, and I want to thank the uh, Science Steering Committee I think I, uh, for this really nice honor. Uh, I'm very pleased. Uh, the other aspect of it I think is kind of neat. Uh, it's a back-to-back -back winner for NRL. Last year was Paul Bernhardt. Uh, not only NRL, we're both in the same division, the plasma physics division, so I think that's kind of neat. Um, <clears throat> one other comment regarding my uh, colleagues here. Uh, Glenn Joyce couldn't make it, unfortunately, because of uh, health reasons. Uh, when we talk about SAMI 2, SAMI 3, I'm the one that stands up and I, my face gets associated but Glenn's the co-author. Uh, he's an incredibly good computational physicist, and the code would not exist without him. Uh, he's played a, a major role through the whole thing, but he's always been kind of in, in the back a little bit. So I just want to make sure everyone recognizes that uh, Glenn is a major player in this. Uh, recently, John Crawl has been working with us, and he's been doing some nice work uh, with simulations and comparing to data. Uh, Slinker and SWISDAC uh, no longer with us, but have uh, worked, and Stan Zazikin has been helping with RCM. Uh, so the ionosphere, uh, <coughs> the weakly ionized gas surrounding the Earth. Uh, the sun here is to the left. Uh, we have sunrise. We build up the ionosphere from photoionization. Uh, it intensifies in the afternoon, and then after sunset, it decays away at night, but never really goes away completely. Uh, it's a multi-ion plasma, and it's a very low beta plasma, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5th. And other plasma uh, regimes, solar physics, interplanetary, uh, beta can be of order of unity or bigger than 1. So it's a different regime than uh, a lot of other space physics is concerned with. Uh, it's relatively cold from my point of view in regards to space physics, although in the labs you can get colder plasmas. And it's highly uh, anisotropic. Uh, the parallel conductivity is much larger than the perpendicular. So because of this, we usually assume the magnetic field lines are equipotential. This is not perfect, but the lowest order is a pretty good assumption. And so we built a model, first SAMI-2, which was a 2D code, and then we went to SAMI-3, a 3D code. Um, we have seven ion species, four atomic and three molecular. Uh, it's an interhemispheric inter model. We have vertical and zonal equal speed drifts. For the neutral species, primarily we use general emphasis and uh, horizontal wind model, uh, but we're working with Jeff Crowley on a small NASA grant to couple to time GCM and informally working with Aaron Ridley to couple to get them. Uh, it's parallelized using MPI, non-orthogonal, non-uniform fixed grid, and we solve continuity, velocity, temperature, and potential equations. <coughs> Uh, these are the ion equations we solve, continuity, velocity, and temperature. Uh, and the P and L up here are the production, uh, photoionization, as well as chemistry, charge exchange, and recombination. Uh, on the ion velocity, there's an electric field. Uh, now we're solving itself consistently, but we also can use uh, electric fields from like the Fay or Shalish model, uh, coupling to the neutrals and to other ions, and then in the ion temperature, uh, coupling to the other species. 
Uh, a couple of comments on how we solve this. First, uh, continuity and ion velocity are solved for all seven ion species, so they're all equal. Uh, so we have full transport on all the uh, ions. Uh, for the temperature, we just saw the temperature for the atomic ions, hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. Two other things, uh, well, one other rather, is we include iron inertia in the code on the left-hand side. Uh, I believe virtually every other model uh, sets this term to zero. One advantage by including this term is that when you go into the plasma sphere where the plasma is collisionless, uh, this introduces ion sound waves, so you can maintain pressure balance along the field line with sound waves, and the velocities remain uh, reasonable. If you calculate the velocity in a collisionless regime uh, based on the ion neutral collision frequencies, the velocities get uh, abnormally high, unphysically high. Uh, it also makes to writing the code a lot easier by keeping this term in here. The downside, it's not always a win, is time step. Uh, in standard ionosphere models, you can get away with time steps of five to 10 minutes. In our code, the time steps are one to 30 seconds because we have to monitor sound waves and, and capture that on the current condition. Uh, for the electron equations, uh, it's the ambipolar field along the magnetic field line, and we have an electron temperature equation. Uh, one point here, this is photoelectron heating source term. Um, we normally use the model developed by Graham Bailey in the 80s in the original SUPM, which is something of an empirical model. Uh, but very recently, Roger Varney at Cornell has actually put in a real physics model here, so that's a major upgrade to the code. And we solve a potential OK wave. We don't solve this entire thing all the time uh, <clears throat> for the specific problems we're working on, but nonetheless, there's Pedersen and Hall conductances, uh, neutral wind and gravity are in it, as well as uh, including region one and region two current systems when we go to high latitude. So that's kind of like a really quick overview of the SAMI-3 model, the equations we solve and some of the things we're doing with it. Uh, now I'll move on to equatorial spread F, which is what we've been working on uh, most intensely for the last several years. Uh, on the left is uh, a nominal profile of the electron density and the various ions in the ionosphere uh, from 10 to the 3 to maybe 10 to the 6 uh, particles per cc. And then uh, we have plasma frequencies here in the megahertz range from about 1 to 9 megahertz. And so using ionosonde, you can uh, send a signal up to the ionosphere. When it hits the plasma frequency, it reflects. And with the time delay, you can calculate virtual heights of the ionosphere. And so if you sweep it, you can sweep out the bottom side of the ionosphere. And people have done that for a long, long time. And so on the right is from the Booker-Wells paper, 1938. Um, and what they notice at night in the equatorial region, this is in Juan Cayo, uh, Peru, uh, you don't always get a nice, clean, smooth uh, bottom side. Sometimes it spreads out. So you're at the equator, you're at the F region, and the signal's spreading, so you get equatorial spread F. Uh, and they noted that, well, the only way you get this, they called it electron clouds populating the ionosphere in this altitude region, uh, tens of meters in scale. So we now call them elect electron uh, irregularities. They use the word clouds. Um, so that's 1938. If we go to more modern diagnostics, this is uh, from John Makala. Uh, he does optical imaging, and you see these large uh, plumes. These are low-density plasma structures that rise up, and they're rather complicated. Uh, they can uh, bifurcate, and they're quite dynamic. And I hope this plays. Uh, So here they come, and as you can see, there's a host of them. Uh, they're very well structured, and they're dynamic. So it's a, it's a really complex problem, and it's a lot cooler looking than simply a, a spread F ionostone gram that spreads. Uh, the other thing John noted are <clears throat> these are tracks of GPS satellites, and when the GPS signal passes through an irregularity to the ground, you get a high S4, it's scintillated and you can actually lose the signal. So this is the operational uh, impact of spread F on communications and navigation. Um, so the question was, oh, if you should back up. 
why do we get spread F? And when they were talking about it in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, one of the ideas was uh, Rayleigh Taylor instability. On the bottom side here, the gradient's going up, gravity's down, they're opposed, so that's Rayleigh Taylor. Then people say, well, wait a second. Up here, the Rayleigh Taylor's stable, and we see turbulence and uh, scattering from up here. Uh, so it's okay down here, but not up here. How do we solve that problem? Uh, Woodman Hello's in 76 put together this cartoon. Uh, we have low density, high density. Low density, uh, they postulated that you got actually a bubble, a bubble rising, and it can penetrate through the high density region into the uh, lower density region above it, and that's how you can get turbulence on the top side of the ionosphere. And they also suggested, uh, again, that as this thing is rising, it generates small-scale turbulence down here, and that's what's causing uh, the scattering of the signals uh, tens of meters. Woodman talked to Osikow at NRL, who was doing various simulations at the time, and said, why don't you guys look at it? And so in 76, the same year, Scanapieco and Osikow uh, did the very first simulation of equatorial spread F, where they demonstrated that you get a low density bubble here, it rises above the top of the, uh, the peak of the ionosphere into the top side. And so this is the first demonstration uh, numerically of equatorial spread F. Uh, by today's standard, it's pretty primitive, but the flip side is they were probably using computers much less powerful than your iPhone. So um, it was a pretty big step. Uh, subsequently, a lot more work was done on it. Uh, Steve Zalzak did a lot of nice simulation work, again in 2D, uh, and introduced color graphics. And so that work went on, and then this shows some Hickamarca scattering off of three meter irregularities uh, by Dave Heisel. Uh, so this is where things stood in the 70s, and so one of the problems in dealing with this uh, is the scale size of density irregularities from tens of kilometers to tens of centimeters. And these are much less than global scales of thousands of kilometers. So people just spent most of the time looking at a rather small segment of the ionosphere to understand how these bubbles develop and form. And so with SAMI-3, that's precisely the tack we took originally. Uh, this is from BESA, and it's just a picture that they developed for their uh, ionospheric work. And I think it's a, a nice uh, view of uh, what we're doing in that these magnetic flux tubes here is the section of SAMI-3 that we modeled initially to study equatorial spread F. And so we took a width of the flux tube about four degrees longitude, which is maybe 500 kilometers, <clears throat> went from 90 kilometers up to 1,600 to 2,400 kilometers, and then the latitudinal width is plus or minus maybe 25 degrees. And then we assume that in the zonal direction we had uh, periodicity. And so this is a representation of our, our wedge model. This shows the extent and the color contours here uh, of the model. So we have these flux tubes that go like this. Uh, in this plane, this is the magnetic equator, that's where people sure, usually show you know, the bubble rising, and you can see it here, it's rising up here, but it's not just in this plane, but it's extended all along the flux tube, so it disturbs the ionosphere uh, over a wide range in latitude as well as altitude. And the other thing we found in this run, um, as it comes up, uh, these are the contours and the blue here is an isosurface of about 10 to the fourth uh, per cc. And as the thing rises up, uh, not only do we bring low density to high altitudes, the thing drains itself away, creating a bubble at high altitude. So it's sort of a drainage effect, and this is a 3D effect that comes in that is new. The other thing we looked at was temperature. And this shows uh, iso contours of the electron temperature. Uh, the nominal temperature of this yellow is like maybe 1,000 K. Uh, this blue contour is on the order of 500 to 600 K. And these red contours are maybe 1,200 K. And so the movie of this, 
as the bubble rises, as you saw, we evacuate the plasma up here. It rarefies, it thins out, and it just adiabatically cools down. Um, the heating down here is caused by ions. Uh, we have ions flowing down the field line. The magnetic fields are converging, so these ions compress as they come down, they heat up. Uh, we've seen this, uh, Rod Helis has shown this in the, uh, the normal ionosphere on occasions with neutral winds. Uh, then what happens is the ions transfer the heat to the electrons and they heat up. And then you see, um, if I can stop it, yeah, here. Then this is heat coming up the top. This is electron heat conduction. Uh, it's very fast. The ions don't heat up, uh, conduct so well. So you get heating of the electrons on the top. So it's a complex uh, structure of electron temperature and ion temperatures in these bubbles. And there's not a whole lot of data out there regarding temperatures for these uh, conditions. There was one paper in the 80s and in the uh, introduction, it was rocket measurement, not rocket, satellite measurements at about 600 kilometers. And they said, uh, we find that going through plasma bubbles, the temperature can get hotter, colder, or stay the same. So that's a modeler's dream, because you get the right answer no matter what. Uh, but we have everything going on here. It doesn't mean it's right, but we're at least consistent. Um, Okay, so we've done a lot more work with the wedge model. I just showed two, uh, two uh, highlights. Um, a lot of work has been done in GRL. John Crawl's uh, done a lot of work uh, comparing semi simulations with data uh, where he's made contacts for these, uh, <coughs> these papers at CEDAR meetings, talking to CEDAR people uh, like Carlo Martinez, John Mackla, and Ethan Miller. So the CEDAR community has actually helped on several of these papers, which I think is really neat. Um, so when I, I started putting this talk together, Barbara Emery called and said, what's the title of your talk? And I said, Global Ionospheric Phenomena. And then I said, Equatorial Spread F. And she said, well, that sounds pretty localized, not global. Uh, and so, so far, yeah, it has been localized. but. Uh, it really is a global phenomenon, and one of the big things that plays into it is the pre-reversal enhancement. Uh, it's noted uh, at sunset as this pre-reversal enhancement. You get this uplifting of the plasma. It steepens the bottom side, and the ionosphere is more prone to develop equatorial spread F and bubbles under these conditions. Uh, instead, when you don't have uh, these pre-reversal enhancements. And so this is a global problem to actually capture this uh, pre-reversal enhancement. That's global on the scale of the uh, Earth. Uh, but we also want to capture bubbles developed uh, in this small scale region or in this post-sunset region to see them develop. So it is a global problem. And to solve that, what Glenn and I did is uh, we took the SAMI-3 model and uh, we basically put a high resolution mesh in it, shown here. Uh, the sun is on the left. We have dawn and dusk. We went into a co-rotating frame. Uh, so this is always in the uh, post-sunset uh, region. And for the nominal grid, we took 90 grid points. So the resolution here is roughly 500 kilometers in the uh, equatorial plane. Uh, in this region where it's red, uh, we put 956 grid points, 0 0.0625 degrees or seven kilometers. So we're going from 500 kilometers to 700, seven kilometers resolution here. This actually looks like a a fill, you know, you, you have a uh, Photoshop or something, you click fill, well it's not, I, I've drawn 956 lines here, and so the resolution in here is actually better than the thickness of one of these lines. Uh, and this is the equation, the potential equation, we solved two points, we've added the co-rotation potential. Um, this is the neutral wind uh, term that gives the dynamo and the pre-reversal enhancement and the global uh, behavior of the electrodynamics, and this is the driver gravity. And caveat, we have an aligned dipole. So in this planet, the magnetic axis is aligned with the spin axis. And so here we have um, the ionosphere. We've let it run for a day or two to get a reproducible situation. Uh, sunrise, noon, uh, afternoon, and then this is sunset. 
So we see the nominal behavior uh, intensification in the afternoon, and then this is the pre-reversal enhancement causing the ionosphere to rise, and then at nighttime it falls and decays away. And in this region here, we put in 5% perturbations, five uh, perturbations, uh, wavelengths of roughly 500 kilometers, and some of these perturbations are before sunset, okay? So in the daytime, we've perturbed the ionosphere, and there's one or two perturbations after sunset. And two hours later, these perturbations have triggered these large-scale bubbles that rise up here. And so even perturbing the ionosphere before the sun sets, when it gets into darkness, uh, it can trigger the instability. And uh, so here's a, a movie. So you can see these perturbations. They stay kind of small until you get after sunset, and then they explode, and we get these large bubbles rising to relatively high altitudes, uh, over 900 kilometers. Uh, this is sort of a blow up. Uh, the previous view graph went from 0 to 24. This is just focusing on the post uh, sunset uh, time. And you can see these bubbles are actually tilted a little bit. Um, so that's also a common feature in uh, these bubble developments. Uh, another point uh, we put in five perturbations, five bubbles came up. Um, but this last bubble down here, it's relatively small. That was not initialized um, by an artificial perturbation. This actually was generated by the bubble ahead of it. So this bubble perturbed the ionosphere sufficiently to actually disturb it here. So there's indication one bubble may be able to generate another bubble. Uh, these are just line plots at 400 kilometers showing that you get relatively strong bite outs uh, of almost two orders of magnitude and density. Uh, we have upward velocities of 200 meters a second, and also in the zonal velocity, their structure. So it's a complex dynamics in developing these bubbles in 3D. Um, this is a different simulation. We did some different geophysical parameters and um, tried to show it globally. Uh, the orangey contour down here is roughly 10 to the 6, and so the sun's out here, we have uh, sunset, and then in this region, you know, these are the equatorial arcs going out. Uh, the yellow contours are at 10 to the 4th, so the yellow contour below this contour, and a yellow contour above it. Okay, so you have 10 to the 6, you have a 10 to the 4, a 10 to the 4. And this structure here is the contour of 10 to the 4th below the F peak rising up, and you can see it disturbs the ionosphere uh, over quite a range uh, latitudinally. And then there's some other bubbles forming here. Uh, so here's the bubbles develop. We get four instead of five. And then when you go into this region, the grid becomes quite coarse and then it numerically just diffuses everything away. But in this region here where we have high resolution, uh, we capture the bubbles and show its impact on the ionosphere uh, from a global perspective. Uh, this is uh, just a snapshot of TEC. Uh, this is similar to the type of uh, imagery you get from GUVI looking at the uh, UV uh, instrumentation. Uh, so in these regions here, we have uh, lower TEC uh, than surrounding it. And so in Goovy, these would be the black stripes they see uh, of weak emissions. Uh, we don't see the big C shapes in this particular run yet, but uh, we do see uh, these large stripes that are rather uh, prominent. <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, um, so we have these tools and these codes. Uh, one is simply we can start doing parametric surveys to see uh, what are some of the issues regarding day-to-day -day variability of equatorial spread F and changing geophysical parameters? Uh, one significant code improvement we intend to do is to incorporate a high-order transport scheme, such as the partial donor cell method. Uh, in these simulations we're doing here, you just get one single bubble rising up. Uh, but we saw from John Mackler's nice images, they bifurcate and they structure and they do things like that. 
And by going to a high order scheme, we should be able to capture sharper gradients and should be able to capture this type of more complex behavior in the code. Uh, and then very recently, we uh, are participating in a NASA LWS program. Uh, we'll be working on 3D electrodynamics with Dave Heisel and Henrique Avera Cornell and with Dave Fritz on gravity wave seeding of uh, equatorial spread out. So we've developed a lot of tools here and now I think we're poised to go in to improve them and then to look at a lot of the physical nature of spread F and what are some of the uh, factors that cause spread F to occur or not to occur. Okay, so I'll change gears a little bit and talk about global electrodynamics. Um, this is just a picture, uh, schematic showing uh, solar winds and region one and two current systems. And when we solve for a potential equation, electric field globally, uh, the dominant drivers are the parallel current systems, uh, the neutral wind, and for spread F, we need gravity. Uh, so the problem is, from a first principle physics model point of view, is tying everything together self-consistently. That's the ultimate goal. We're not there yet, and people are working on that. And so we're trying to work on it also. And so I'll show some... Uh, sort of like a progress report of some of the things we've been doing and what we're working on. Um, so in this first uh, set of results, uh, this is work we did with uh, Steve Slinker at NRL coupling SAMI-3 to LFM. And what was done here is SAMI-3 provides conductances, LFM takes those conductances, solves for the potential, and that potential in the electric field resulting from it is used both by SAMI-3 and LFM. And so this is the northern pole and this is the south pole. These are the potentials. And so these are these tongues of ionization. As a, in this case, as a storm builds up and this intensifies, uh, plasma from the day side can be convected across the top of the polar cap. And this is an animation. So when these Potentials intensify, then you get this behavior of these tongues of ionization. You can also see these things, especially here, swinging back and forth. That's associated with the IMF. There's a BY that's swinging back and forth, and that's causing this slewing here. Uh, the other thing, uh, we've been working with Stan Zazakin at Rice, and he's recently uh, been doing a little more work on our coupling, and he's done these runs. Uh, he sent the code to NRL, and then we were able to run the code at NRL and reproduce his results. Uh, but what we're trying to, again, look at uh, are some of the global behaviors associated with penetrating electric fields and the like. And so we get this uh, around uh, the equator, the intensity here, but we get some additional enhancements here, and then this type of behavior uh, both in the southern region, and it's also in the northern region, but it's more intense down here for this particular simulation. So this is another work in progress, uh, trying to capture things like SEDs and the like that John Forster has been talking about. Uh, for global electrodynamics, in these last two uh, simulation studies, both with LFM and RCM, LFM and RCM are solving for the potential. Uh, but the problem there is LFM solves for the potential uh, down to about 55 degrees. Uh, so they don't go to the equator. Uh, RCM solves it from about 10 degrees to maybe 72 degrees. So they don't go to the pole and they don't go to the equator. But we want to go global. So Glenn and I have been working on solving uh, a potential globally from the equator uh, to the pole. And this is just some preliminary uh, results where uh, the red and blue up here are field aligned currents from LFM. We just take those field aligned currents as well as uh, a, a wind model and solve for the potential. And so we get this two cell convection pattern, uh, which is pretty common, but we're not restricted uh, like LFM is to put a zero somewhere at around 55 degrees. And you can get some of the uh, potential to penetrate to the equator. So this is another uh, piece of uh, physics we're working on. You know, the good news is the code kind of works. Quantitatively, we're not quite right there. So this is, again, a, a work in progress. Um, we're also doing some plasmaspheric work. John Kroll's PI on a, an LWS program to uh, develop a first principle model of the 
plasmasphere. And so this is a, a run I did last week. Uh, we just took SAMI-3 and I put a modif modified vol in stern potential plus co-rotation. Um, and the first thing I think is most important is this plasma sphere that develops is green, which agrees with the image data. Uh, the other aspect I want to point out, this is not the plasma pause. This is an ISO contour of around 2 times 10 to the 3. Um, we're just trying to set up a steady state uh, plasma sphere. And I ran the code for 24 hours. 24 hours is not long enough. You can see the, there's a lot of transients that develop. It smooths out. Uh, as we convect into the backside, we can build up. Then there's some interesting things here. It looks like flux tubes coming up and filling. And then it stops. And so we've only run 24 hours. It's not gone to a steady state situation yet. Uh, in this run, this notch back here is midnight and the sun is down here. So this is another thing we're actively pursuing is this type of a model. And one aspect of SAMI-3 that uh, is unique is we have composition. So we have oxygen, hydrogen, and helium. And so we can, after we get a steady state plasma sphere developed, we can actually look at what the composition is and then compare it to data, uh, such as image, which actually sees helium. And can we reproduce some of the features uh, seen by image. Okay, um, so I've talked about SAMI-3 and how we've applied the work to equatorial spread F. And then this last section has been on global electrodynamics and how we're trying to uh, couple to other models and to uh, get a better first principle models of the plasma sphere. Um, okay, so when Larissa sent me an email and said I won this prize. I was really happy and I wrote back and I said, well, great, I'll talk about spread F. And she said, well, wait a second, there's going to be gem people there. Uh, you should say something gemmy. Um, but we have a conflict. I don't know how many gem people are here since it's a parallel session with gem. But thinking there would be gem people here, <coughs> I put together some gem stuff. Um, and so it's really different and it's whole MHD, and so before my SAMI-2 career, I did a lot of uh, ideal and whole MHD work. And this is really big in the GEM community, and the reason is because back in the late 90s, there was a GEM reconnection challenge, and people used various models to study reconnection, and Shea and Drake at Maryland put the whole term into uh, an MHD code, and they found with the whole term, you get fast reconnection. The reconnection rate was the same as you got out of particle simulation codes and out of hybrid codes. So you were capturing something really important with a fluid code by incorporating the whole term. Um, so what the whole term does is it decouples the ions from the electrons. Um, you assume that the electrons are frozen into the magnetic field. E plus VE cross B is zero. Uh, defining J, uh, taking this VE, putting it up here, you then have a different Ohm's law for the ions. It's VI cross B plus J over B, J cross B over NEC. That's the Hall term. So on length scales smaller than the ion inertial length, ion motion, electron motion decouple. And so as reconnection occurs, you come inside to C over omega PI. Now the ions do something different than the electrons. And this provides a mechanism to set up the dynamics for fast reconnection. Um, however, I don't want to talk about reconnection. There's this other issue um, that it's not in the GEM community. People don't talk about it much. And it, it may have relevance to space physics. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, this is a two-dimensional problem. And so you have this uh, density profile, this high plane that drops off into a valley. It's asymmetric, and then you come off a cliff. All right, so you have this, maybe somewhere out in the outskirts of Santa Fe, there might be some terrain like this. Uh, initially, there's no magnetic field. And what is done is on this back boundary, uh, this boundary here, you take the magnetic field and you just increase it in time. Um, 
This may sound hokey, um, but it's not. The, actually, the relevance is to plasma opening switches in laboratories. This is precisely what happens. And so the question is, as you increase the magnetic field on this back boundary, how does it propagate through this system? Well, in ideal MHD, the magnetic field comes in just as a pressure. So when you get a sufficient magnetic pressure on this back side, the magnetic field will penetrate into here and will push the density out of the way and just sort of snow plow it. So that's ideal MHD. And um, so you're increasing the magnetic field, it propagates in and it pushes the density out of the way. Uh, then you get this waterfall effect and it splashes out. And uh, when I was looking at this this morning and thinking about this, somehow it struck me this was not unlike uh, perhaps a plasma tsunami after listening to Mike's talk last night, um, the way this just rushes in. <clears throat> Okay, so that's ideal MHD, and it seems plausible, and we can understand it. Uh, for Hall MHD, I took an extreme case called electron Hall MHD, and in that particular uh, state, what you do is you freeze the ions. The ions are not allowed to move. You only watch propagation of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is increasing on this back boundary. The density is not changing, it's frozen. So you want to see how does this magnetic field propagate in the system under the condition of Hall MHD. <coughs> so this doesn't move. Here comes the magnetic field. <coughs> well, it doesn't fill up this whole region, and then it comes to here, and it takes a sharp right. Completely different. Okay, so. The magnetic field is propagating on this density gradient. It comes to this density gradient and hooks and goes along uh, the side of this escarpment or cliff, if you will. So it, it, it's a really different behavior. And what it is is it's a magnetic drift wave, a high frequency magnetic drift wave. Uh, this is the uh, phase velocity of the wave. And what the point is, when the density gradient is smaller than C over omega pi, this coefficient can be big, i.e. bigger than the alphane velocity, so you can propagate this wave faster than an alphanic uh, disturbance. The other feature is that it propagates in the B cross grad n direction. So in this density uh, profile here, uh, B cross grad n on this gradient is down here. Uh, with the gradient here, B cross grad N is now this way. So this is an unusual uh, high frequency drift wave. And in space physics, people don't, I think, know about it. Uh, one possible or way it might come in, uh, if you have uh, strong density gradients on some boundary layers, this may provide a way to get rapid magnetic field transport through that layer it would be faster than alphanic. So that's one just possibility. Um, all right, so to summarize, um, we've done a lot of work uh, with regard to equatorial spread F, both with our wedge model and now with the global SAMI-3 model. Uh, there's a lot more work to do. Uh, electrodynamics, high order transport, working with Crowley on time GCM, uh, gravity wave seeding with Dave Fritz. And we're also doing a lot of work to improve our global electrodynamic picture and uh, expanding the model into the plasma sphere to get a better understanding there. So I have one more view graph, and I've shown this maybe once before. Uh, what, what does SAMI2 look like? Uh, usually when you look at this code, it's thousands of lines of Fortran, which is somewhat meaningless to most people and certainly not attractive. But uh, thanks to the internet, I, I found a picture of SAMI2. Uh, it's right here. And um, the reason I found her was uh, about, geez, over 10 years ago, we open sourced SAMI2. And so as it was open sourced, it's on the web. And I kept, gosh, I got to Google it. What's our rank? What's our rank? And so while I was Googling it for the first six months or so, she was the number one hit on Google. She was ranked one. Uh, 
But then after about a year, actually our open source model became number one, has stayed there since. So it's one of the first times I would think that uh, in Google, um, a computer code has uh, outranked beauty. So I, I take that as a, a plus. Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Joe, thank you very, very much. Um, it's my happy honor to be able to give you the CEDAR certificate for 2011 for being the CEDAR Prize lecturer. It says, presented to Dr. Joseph Huba, Naval Research Laboratory, in recognition of outstanding scientific contribution to the coupling, energetics, and dynamics of atmospheric regions, CEDAR community, CEDAR Prize lecture. It's a great talk, Joe. Thank you very much.